Okay, welcome everyone to your synoptic revision session. Uh, tonight we are going to have a look at a task one. We've still got a few more people joining, um, but we'll make a start. We're going to look at a task one tonight. Um, this is kind of the last task that we need to look at. We've looked at the other five. The only one that we haven't looked at now is task one. And task one is kind of a little bit of a mixture of everything. Um, there can be a number of different uh, topics that come up in task one. And I think when I mentioned this last week, a number of you said that actually, do you know what? We found task one and task five, maybe the multiple choice questions, which people might underestimate a little bit and think are easier because they are multiple choice. Actually, we found those bits really difficult because they can bring in lots of different areas from lots of different other exams, you know, particularly uh, bits of financial statements, bits of advanced bookkeeping even. Um, lots of different exams, lots of different material um, that you could pop up in a task one. Task one is a little bit unpredictable. So that's what we're going to have a look at tonight. Like I said, guys, you know, lots of you asking about previous recordings, etc. Remember, previous recordings from any sessions that have been on in the past will be attached to my email that I send around on a Friday. There'll be a PDF document attached to that email and it will be uh, including the links and the passcodes to previous sessions which have been recorded that you can watch over. You can choose which ones that you want to watch again and you can watch them as many times as you like like so don't forget that they are there because I must also remind you before I forget that there is not going to be a session next week uh, next week we have a little bit of a break just for half term so we don't tend to run revision sessions during the half term breaks just because a lot of tutors are off um, and we, we struggle with availability during half term breaks so there's not going to be a session next Thursday evening but please do remember you've got all of those recordings. You know, you can still go on at half seven. Guys, you can go on at half seven and you can pretend like you're doing it. You know what I mean? You can, you can still leave that time free for you to revise and go and have a look at some of the recordings, all right? Because there are recordings there that cover every single task in your professional synoptic exam. So anything you need, go and watch the recordings, all right? Please do use them as much as you can, use them to your advantage. Like I said, I'll send them around tomorrow. So you've got plenty there, guys, all right? I promise you've got plenty there. We have to have a little bit of a break every now and then uh, for, the, for the tutors, just so they can have a little bit of a break, just in case they're on holiday, etc. Okay. <laughs> oh, thank you, honey, I appreciate that. Um, Okay, there are loads of videos on there. I don't know how many of you look on that PDF. I reckon there's at least, oh, there we go, Hanny. I was gonna say 20 to 30 and Hanny's put on there 26. It really, there will be a video recording, an hour's video recording that covers every single task, all right? So anything that you think you need to go over, please do have a look on there. Right, let's have a look at task one. How did you find task one this week, guys? How did you find, you know, has anybody had a look at it before? Hard, honey, you found it quite difficult. Yeah, yeah, I thought particularly part A was quite hard, maybe. Uh, brought in some of your advanced bookkeeping knowledge. So do you know what, before we have a go at part A, I'm going to read it through. Um, and then what I'm going to do is just maybe have a little bit of revision over this area, because I think part A is quite tricky. And it is something that commonly does come up in a task one for your professional synoptics. So let's have a read through what the question is asking first. So it says you've got a number of meetings planned for today, you need to prepare some information in advance. And then it says Ada would like to discuss some aspects of the purchases process and has asked whether the following errors would be detected by a purchase ledger control account reconciliation to the purchase ledger. So this is something that would have come up in your advanced bookkeeping exam purchase ledger control account reconciliations or equally a sales ledger control account reconciliation. Now this is something that students tend to find quite difficult when we look at advanced bookkeeping and you probably haven't looked at advanced bookkeeping for a little while now so it's still equally as difficult. So what I want to do is just go over 
a little bit of information to do with this reconciliation process. So first off, let's just think about this flow of information, how my account system actually works or how my bookkeeping system works. So first off, and this talks us through a sales process, but it's exactly the same for a purchase process. You're just looking at purchase day book, you know, the other side of things. So this talks us through a sales process. So I can see that first off, my invoice is created. So first off, I start with a sales invoice up here. And then once I've got my sales invoice, where does that get input into first? Well, the first place I go to is my books of prime entry, prime meaning first. And in the case of a sales invoice, that means that it would first go to my sales day book. Brilliant. So then I go down to my sales day book. Now I haven't done any double entry at that point because from that point, then my sales day book, my sales invoices keep going in there and then they get totaled up and those totals from the sales day book then go into my general ledger. That's when we start bringing double entry into things. That general ledger is also known as the nominal ledger means exactly the same thing. So from my sales day book, it's the totals that go to the general ledger. That's where I start bringing in my debits and credits. So then I go to my sales ledger control account. So this is just the totals that get posted in my sales ledger control account, i.e. debit sales ledger control account, credit sales, credit revenue. Then what happens uh, from that general ledger is those T accounts then get closed off at the end of the period and the balances from those T accounts get taken to my trial balance. My trial balance is then what I create my financial statements from, right? So that's my basic process. But the problem with this is that when I'm looking at my sales ledger control account, only the totals from the sales day book are going there. Now that's great. That means that I can see in this case how much the customers owe me. But I can only see how much all of the customers owe me. I can only see how much they owe me in total. I've got one receivables figure. What about if I wanted to know just how much one customer owes me? Well, I can't see that from the sales ledger control account. Instead, I have to go to my subsidiary account, also known as my memorandum ledger, also known as my sales ledger. And that's quite where it gets a little bit tricky because the sales ledger control account sounds very similar to the sales ledger, but they are not the same thing. Equally, the purchase ledger control account sounds very similar to the purchase ledger. Again, not the same thing. So purchase ledger control account, sales ledger control account only show the totals, the total amount owed to all the suppliers, the total amount owed to us by all of our customers. What we need is this side note. It's a bit that goes with those control accounts called a memorandum or subsidiary ledger. And what these do is then note down how much we owe each supplier and how much each customer owes us. So it looks a little bit like this. You can see that that means that things, invoices, must be recorded in two places. They need to go to the general ledger, double entry wise, payables, receivables, but they also need to be recorded in that memorandum ledger, sales ledger or purchase ledger. So here again, we're using the sales system and we can see that there are two invoices, invoice one and two go into two different customers and they've been uh, entered into the sales day book. Now the totals from that sales day book has then been taken down into my general ledger, also known as my nominal ledger. And like we said, um, it would have debited the receivables, credited revenue. That would be the double entry for that total there of 350 pounds. 
But we also need to update this note that goes with the general ledger because that's fine. I can see there that my customers owe me 350, but what if I want to know how much each customer owes me? Well, then I go and have a look at my sales ledger. This is the memorandum ledger that goes with it. And in here, I can see that it's split down by each customer. And hopefully then you can see that if I added together everything that was owed from each customer on my sales ledger, that would then equal the total that I see on my sales ledger control account. And this would be exactly the same on the purchases side. I'd have a purchase ledger with lots of different suppliers listed out and I would have a purchase ledger control account. But the total of this memorandum ledger should always be the total figure I'm seeing in that control account. And that means that I can do a reconciliation between those things. They should always be the same, but as we know with bookkeeping, with accounting, yes, they should always agree, but they don't always, do they? So there would be a number of differences. Maybe there's a credit note that I haven't recorded in the sales ledger, but it has been included in the sales ledger control account, for example. There might be a number of differences, which means that they are not the same amount, but they should always be the same figure. So if they're not, there's something I need to correct in there. Just a little bit of revision over that area before we look at part A, because that is what part A is about then, guys. So I can include that those little couple of pages in my email tomorrow if, if that's helpful for anyone. So now let's have a look at part A then, because part A is going to give me a number of different errors and I need to decide whether these errors would be detected by a reconciliation or would not be picked up by a reconciliation. So let's work through them. Think about what we have, a total over here in a control account and a number of different suppliers listed over here in a memorandum account. Think of it as just a note to the control account. First one, a credit note posted to the wrong supplier account. Do we think, yes, that is going to be detected or no, that's not going to be detected? Brilliant, guys. Very well done. The answer is no, that wouldn't be detective. Because if we think about it, the totals are still going to agree, aren't they? My whole point of our reconciliation is that I'm adding up everything that's on the subsidiary ledger and seeing if that matches the total in my control account. Well, in this case, my totals are still... <laughs> I did rather give you the answer there, honey. But in this case, the totals are still absolutely going to match, aren't they? Because if this was just posted to the wrong supplier account, if it's, as long as it is posted in one of the supplier accounts somewhere, the totals are still going to match. Next one then. Incorrect discount given by a supplier. A 15% trade discount was deducted instead of 10%. Yes for detected, no for not detected. Very well done, guys. It looks like you have done very well on these questions indeed. Absolutely right. Again, no, that is not going to be detected. The reason it's not going to be detected is because both places are going to be wrong. If the supplier gave you the wrong invoice, if the wrong amount was on that invoice, you want to know that. You've then posted the invoice in the control account and the memorandum ledger. They match. They just happen to match at the wrong amount. So it just doesn't uh, get detected because both amounts are wrong, but they do still agree. <laughs> Thank you very much, Annie. Next one, an addition error resulting in an incorrect net amount posted on an invoice to the purchase day book. Now, before I get you to answer this question, I'm going to think about the double entry for posting a purchase invoice that has VAT on it. So let's think about the double entry first. My gross amount, my gross amount is going to be credited to my purchase ledger control account, right? 
then my net amount is going to be debited to, let's say, purchases. And then my VAT amount is going to be debited to that VAT control account. That's my double entry for posting an invoice that has VAT on it. Now, this error says that it's an addition error resulting in an incorrect net amount. Now, the trick with these questions, if they have told you that one thing is wrong, you always assume that the other things are correct. So if they've only told you that the one thing is wrong, all you can assume is that the other postings are correct. Now that I have said that and I've told you that the net amount goes to purchases, which is a profit and loss account, an expense account. Is that going to be detected by the reconciliation or not? Okay, still got a couple of swaying answers there. So the answer for this one is no, guys. The reason that it's no is because only this figure they have told you is incorrect. Well, this figure isn't going to the purchase ledger control account or the purchase ledger. The figure that goes to the purchase ledger control account and the memorandum account is the gross amount because the supplier is going to pay us the full gross amount, aren't they? If the supplier already paid us the net amount, then we wouldn't be very happy. So the amount that we're taking to the purchase ledger control account and the purchase ledger is actually this gross amount. The fact that they've added up something wrong and this net figure is incorrect hasn't affected our purchase ledger control account or our purchase ledger. We only say that the wrong thing, we can only, only assume that the only wrong posting here was the net amount. It says there was an addition error resulting in an incorrect net amount, which means the only bit that was incorrect is this amount. That wrong amount, therefore, has gone to the profit and loss. It's gone to whether it was purchases, whatever it was, it's gone to the profit and loss. That's absolutely right, Anastasia. The total of the purchase ledger control account and the purchase ledger will absolutely still be the same because it's that gross amount that's going to go to the control account and the memorandum account. And the gross amount, as far as we know, is still absolutely correct. It's only the net amount that is wrong and the net amount has gone to purchases, not either of the things that we're looking at in the reconciliation. Does that help guys? It's a tricky one, that one, but this error will go to purchases. Sarah, if the VAT was wrong, then your VAT control account would be incorrect. In this case, because the net amount is wrong, it's just the purchases code that's incorrect. Brilliant. Okay, perfect, guys. All right, let's move on. Next one says a purchase invoice debited to the accounts payable control, i.e. the purchase ledger control. Yes for detected or no for not? Very well done, guys. Yes, absolutely. This one finally is an error that would be detected by the reconciliation. Why would it be detected? Well, it would be wrong, the wrong way, wouldn't it? Look at my postings. I've just drawn out the debits and credits. You're absolutely right. It should be on the credit side of the purchase ledger control account. And therefore, my totals are going to be all wrong because it is in the wrong side of the T account. So absolutely right. That amount should be a credit in the purchase ledger control account. And therefore, those totals are not going to agree. Always think with these errors, will it change the totals? If the answer is yes, it would be detected by the reconciliation. If the answer is no, then it's not going to be detected. So the final one there, guys, says incorrect price charged by one supplier. Yes or no there?
That's it, guys. Yeah, that one is a no. That one is not going to be detected because just like the second option there, the invoice is going to be wrong, isn't it? The supplier has put the wrong amount on the invoice uh, and therefore we would have just posted the invoice as we were giving it. And therefore, we'd have the wrong total in both the purchase ledger control account and the purchase ledger. We wouldn't know that they were wrong until the supplier actually lets us know. And then we will have to change both amounts accordingly. OK, happy with part A there, guys. Or happy-ish, as happy as you can be. I use the word happy loosely, but feeling OK about it. <laughs> Excellent. That's what I like to hear. Okay, perfect. Let's move on then. I think that was a tricky part, but it is popular. They do like to bring in that little bit from advanced bookkeeping. So, second part of this question says, which one of the following internal control procedures over purchases and subsequent payments is most likely? Always watch out when they say that. You're looking for the best option. They're not saying that any of these are wrong options. You're looking for the best option. So which one is most likely to be effective for a business in reducing the risk of fraud? Let's see what we've got. So the accounts payable clerk accounts for the purchase invoices. The accounts payable manager sets up the payments and the FC then authorizes the payments. So I'm I'm, I'm imagining that they're talking about segregation of duties here. And in this one, I seem to have got three people involved. The second option says the accounts payable manager accounts for the purchase invoices and the accounts payable clerk makes the payment. So again, I've got a bit of segregation of duties. I like that there's more than one person involved. But in this one, I've only got two people involved. Third option says the accounts payable manager accounts for the purchase invoices and makes the payments. OK, so in this case, I've actually only got one person involved. So I've got no segregation of duty going on here, have I? Last one, I've got the financial controller accounts for the purchase invoices and makes the payments. Again, even though it's the financial controller who may well, you know, have lots of experience and know, of course, what they're doing, there's still only one person involved and that makes fraud much more likely. So when you look at it like that, I think you guys are happy already that, yes, the first option is the best option to go for there, isn't it? I've got the accounts payable clerk doing the purchase invoice, the manager setting up the payments, and those payments are then authorised by the financial controller. That would make it quite difficult for, for example, the clerk to be able to commit fraud, set up a fake supplier, because the manager is the person who sets up the payments and they have to be authorised as well. So I like that system. Segregation of duties, very popular in the synoptic exam. Try and talk about segregation of duties as much as you can. Okay, next bit. Accounting for numerical sequences of invoicing. So, you know, having my invoices and saying invoice one, two, three, four, five, etc. Having that numerical sequence, hopefully in order, is an example of an internal control to ensure accuracy of which of the following. So what we need to do is think about why we do those numerical sequences. Now, really, the reason that we do that is to be able to spot any gaps. So it would be very obvious if I was an auditor, for example, going into a system, having a look through some sales invoices, and it goes one, two, three, five, six, seven. I'd be thinking, well, hang on a minute. Where's invoice number four? It would be quite obvious to see that not all of the invoices were included if they told me they were using a numerical sequence. So, having said that, let's have a read through. First option says, one person is not responsible for placing orders, recording purchases and making payments. Well, that has absolutely nothing to do with numerical sequencing, does it? That's talking about segregation of duties. 
Second option says goods and services are only purchased from reliable suppliers. Well, that would be, for example, an approved supplier list. They might be talking about an approved supplier list there. They're not talking about uh, invoice numbering. So I've got my option three and four, and they seem to be the only options that you've gone for in the chat box. So let's have a look at those. Option number three. What we're doing is ensuring all purchases relating to goods received are recorded. So making sure that all of the purchases, the invoices are there. OK, or option four is saying all transactions have been recorded in the correct period. Can I tell whether an invoice has been recorded in the correct period from the sequential number at the top of the page? No. What would I need to look at if I was looking at whether an invoice was in the correct period or not? Exactly. I'd be looking at the dates. I would want to be looking at the tax point on that invoice date, wouldn't I? So sequential invoice numbering helps me with number three option. It helps me to see that all of my invoices are actually there. It makes it nice and obvious if there is something missing because I can clearly see that they should be going in order. Now, don't get me wrong, it might help to ensure that invoices are, are in the correct period. But if you've got a supplier who takes a long time to invoice you, you know, it could end up being invoice number 10 and actually the date is much further you know but yeah absolutely Jackie I can think of a few of those when I worked in industry as well it could end up being invoice number 10 actually the date was ages ago so those numbers they might help with the cutoff but they're not you're looking at the dates to find out if something's in the correct period right what it will do by invoicing numbering your invoices is to try and help to ensure that all purchases relating to goods received are actually recorded, making sure that you are unlikely to miss any invoices. Okay, well done there guys, lots of you getting that right, very well done. Let's move on to part B then. So part B has given us a little bit more information um, and actually this is testing whether we know sort of the job roles between directors and shareholders. So it says you have a meeting with Sean and Caroline, they are the directors from your Veggie Delight scenario of course, and they want to know whether selling an equity stake in the business to venture capitalists would reduce their control over the decision making process. So they're thinking about selling some shares. They want to ask you about the decisions which are made by directors and those made by shareholders. To prepare for this meeting, you should complete the table below to identify who should be responsible for each decision. So, this one may be more tricky than it initially looks. What we need to be happy with is who directors are and who shareholders are, right? So, in most big businesses, the business is, of course, owned by the shareholders, but the business is ran by the directors. So the directors are almost the managers of the business. They're doing the day to day running of the business. But the shareholders appoint the directors to run the business for them. So the shareholders are kind of the people who are putting the money into the business. But they're saying, Do you know what, maybe they've got no expertise in running a business, whatever that business does. Let's say it's an ice cream shop. Do you know what? I know nothing about selling ice cream. I've got lots of money, but I've got <laughs> no, I know nothing about selling ice cream. So what I would like to do is put lots of money into this business and then I would like to hire someone who knows lots about selling ice cream to run that business for me and to make me lots of money. And hopefully I'll be able to take dividends out of that company uh, and, and, you know, I won't have to do too much, really. So the shareholders are the people who own the company. The directors are doing the running of the company. So having said that, let's now think about these. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right, guys. I always send the question in an email bef the week before. So tomorrow, I probably won't send one tomorrow because there is no session next week. 
but <laughs> in the prior week then I will then send uh, you've always got a copy of the question before the session guys let's go through then so first off the appointment of auditors think here about who the auditors work for now if you haven't done your external audit exam this might be a little bit tricky or if you don't work in audit this might be a little bit tricky who do you think the auditors work for okay let me give you a little bit of a background to audit I used to work in audit. I actually started my career in audit. It was something that I, I liked doing on. <laughs> I like that little for shareholders to spy on the directors. <laughs> okay, so here's what I did as an auditor, okay? As an auditor, I was going in to check the financial statements, right? Check the systems, check the financial statements, check that the financial statements were giving a true and fair view. Now, whose responsibility is it to do those financial statements? The financial statements of companies, whose responsibility is it to do those financial statements? Absolutely, you've hit the nail on the head there. The directors are responsible for completing the financial statements whether they hire accountants to help them do that, whatever, it's always ultimately the directors who are responsible for producing the financial statements. Now, as an auditor, I'm going in and checking that the directors are running that company properly, that their records are you know, A-OK, -okay, and therefore their financial statements are showing a true and fair view. So as an auditor, it doesn't make sense that I work for the directors, does it? Because I'm basically going to check up on them. But remember what I said, the shareholders own the company and the shareholders then direct the directors to run the company for them. So I'm going in on behalf of the shareholder. Brilliant, honey. So the shareholder, me as an auditor, I'm not an auditor anymore, but let me just put my auditor hat back on. Let's say I am the auditor. I'm going in on behalf of that shareholder. I'm going to say, do you know what, Mr. Shareholder? I'm going to go and check over this business. I'm going to go have a look through the records. I'm going to ask your directors lots of questions. I'm going to try and find out everything that's happened this year. And then I will be able to tell you whether I think they have produced a set of true and fair financial statements. If I was doing that on the upper half of the directors, well, the directors are the people doing the financial statements. That doesn't make so much sense, does it? So auditors are always appointed by shareholders. And then the auditors go in to check that the directors are, are essentially doing their job properly. Okay. The next one, now this is a tricky one. Think about who might have to authorise this rather than who might make the decisions. Think about who might have to authorise this with, let's say, company's house. Changing the company name. Well done, guys. Lots of you getting that. So here... This is a tricky one. It's a little bit blurry because in reality, probably maybe, you know, a change in company name, a change in direction might be something that the directors actually initially float the idea of, right? They might say, do you know what? I think we need to rebrand ourselves. If we do this, we'll be able to get in lots more revenue. Um, let's scrap the old name. Let's go with something new. Let's rebrand ourselves and change the name. But ultimately, the shareholders would need to authorise that. So ultimately, that big decision must be the decision of the shareholders. Now, that might be spurred on by the directors first, which is why I think this question is a little bit tricky. But ultimately, that has to be, yes, it has to have the say-so of the shareholders. Okay, so shareholders is the right answer there. Next one. A capital investment, so maybe I buy some machinery, exceeding £2 million. Director's decision or shareholder's decision? Okay, we've got a couple of different answers here again. So this time, guys, think about who's running the business. 
the directors are running the business. Two million pounds for Veggie Delights. Okay, they're a fairly big business. Two million pounds is still a lot of money, but they are a fairly big business. The directors don't let that two million pounds throw you off. The directors are running the company. They are the people making the investment decisions. They do not need the say so of the shareholders to be able to do that. The directors are there to run the company, to make the strategic decisions, you know, to, to put the objectives in force, to get the mission statement going, to run the managers, to tell everyone what to do. And if they think that they need to invest in some new machinery, the directors are absolutely capable of doing that. The shareholders have trusted the directors to run that business for them. Okay. You're absolutely right. No matter what the value, it would always be a director's decision. That's absolutely right, Susanna. The auditors, if they seriously thought that it would make no sense that you would spend two million pounds on investment, then that was the sort of thing that maybe an auditor would say to the shareholders. It doesn't really make sense that you've spent so much on PPE this year. You know, you just don't necessarily have uh, the authority. But there we go. Francesca, would the shareholders have an input if the amount was higher? No, it doesn't matter what amount they put there do not let that throw you off investment decisions are made by directors they run the company okay so any decisions in regards to how the company is run will be made by the directors the shareholders they don't want to get involved in that sort of thing right that's why they appoint the directors to do it for them next one having said that closing down a restaurant who do you think would make that decision then running the business i've got a restaurant that is not uh making any profit i'm a director i'm thinking about the strategic aims of the company and yes that would be included in that anastasia the shareholders are really just there to input money and to take dividends if they're not getting dividends they'll just sell their shares and go and invest in another company does that make sense? So the shareholders, they're going to read over the financial statements and say, yeah, I'd like to invest in this company. <laughs> they are there to appoint the auditors. Yes, I would like to have a look at these financial statements. I would like to invest in this company. I believe it's going to, you know, bring me some money via dividends, but they don't make any business decisions, the shareholders. Yeah, absolutely. They're interested in the profits and losses, Anastasia. Absolutely. They're interested in the amount of dividend that a company can pay out. Um, Ashley, no, because it's not the shareholders really who ultimately own it. Remember, it's the company who ultimately owns that restaurant and the company is a separate legal entity. So the shareholders don't ultimately own that business. The company owns that restaurant, for example. So any strategic decisions to do with running the company, the directors make. Think, guys, if you had shares, my, my mum, for example, last night she told me she's got some shares in Lloyd's, I think she said. I don't know why. She's never told me about these shares before. I don't know where they came from. But she told me she's got some shares in Lloyd's. Can you imagine Lloyd's Bank ringing up my mum and saying, we're thinking of closing a branch on the high street, Fiona. Um, will that be okay with you? What do you think my mum's going to say? She's got no idea on how Lloyd's is run, on how to run a business. She doesn't work in the banking sector. She, she's going to be like, well, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you can if you want. She'd be going, oh, I think that's a lovely idea. Yes, go ahead and do that, whatever you think. Do you know what I mean? So think of the shareholders as these outside people, outside people that don't necessarily get that say. The reason they have that ultimate final decision in changing the company name is because it must be authorised by, for example, a vote at a general meeting to change that information on company's house. But don't let that throw you off for the others, okay? Any strategic companies, <laughs> I like that you're going to think of my mum when that question comes up, Ashley. Any strategic decisions of the company is made by the director. Next one, reappointment of directors. <laughs> Who's that going to be? 
Yes, absolutely. That only makes sense for it to be the shareholders, right? The directors can't appoint their own directors. <laughs> Otherwise, we would end up with far too many directors. <laughs> so it's always the shareholders who are appointing the directors to run the business for them. And finally, who decides how much dividend the company pays out? Think about who's receiving the dividend and therefore who must be deciding on the amount of dividends. So the directors are there to generally make as much profit as possible, right? That's what most businesses are in business for. Not all businesses, but most businesses are in business to make profit. The shareholders are just there to take their dividends. Now, again, imagine my mum ringing up Lloyd's and saying, this year, I would like a dividend of £100,000, please. Um, I'd like you to pay me out a dividend of £100,000. What do you think the directors are going to say to that? They're going to say, I don't think so, Fiona. If you're looking at that sort of money, you're going to have to go buy shares in another company or buy a lot more shares in Lloyd's because she really doesn't have that many. So it is the directors who make those strategic business decisions. They absolutely then, they know how much profit is there. They know what is happening in the financial statements. They know whether they need those reserves in the company or not. They decide how much dividend is paid out. They might pay a big dividend out to keep the shareholders happy, or they might pay a small dividend out to keep the money in the business because, for example, they want to make a big change next year that's going to cost a lot of money. So it's the directors who decide how much dividend is paid out. Good little one to practice that one, guys. OK, so you can go over that again. Of course, you've got this. I'll send you the annotated version as well. <laughs> I, it, I promise this question is not about my mum, but it was it, I don't know why she mentioned those shares to me last night, but it, it just came to me. <laughs> All right, let's finish off part C of this question as well then. So part C says, Maisie, my goddaughter's name, Maisie has asked you to make some suggestions which help you to keep the daughter, uh, daughter, goddaughter, data is what I meant to say, help you to keep the data on the individual computers safe. At the moment, everybody uses the same password, which has so far not been changed. Okay. Data is backed up manually by each user at the end of each day. That sounds a bit risky. I wouldn't want First Intuition to trust me every day to back up all our data. And virus protection software is in place. Well, luckily, that sounds okay. I mean, it looks like we're going to need some virus protection in this system. So it says, which two of the following should be considered, and this is key here, the most important steps to take immediately. So it's not saying that you wouldn't want to do more than two of these, but it's saying think about which two of these are the most urgent, are the most important. So the first one says, introduce a new policy to change passwords every three months. Well, I like the sound of that. The next one says, request each user to set their own password. Now that one I think is very important. On this system, everybody uses the same password. So everybody can get into any one system because they all know the password. What on earth is the point in even having a password if everyone uses the same password? There isn't one, is there? So that one is definitely urgent. This one I like, and I will implement this, but this one seems extremely urgent. The third one says install new antivirus software. Well, actually, it says that software is in place. So I definitely you know, don't think I need to do this. Of course, when it runs out, I need to keep updating it. But I don't think I need to do this at the moment. The next one says set the system to prompt for a new password every three months. Well, again, that links with the first one, doesn't it? I like it. I'm going to put a tick next to it. But let's see if the last one is maybe more urgent. 
set an automatic backup for all computers to run each evening. The fact that this data is manually backed up by each user at each day, so we are trusting all of our staff every day at five o'clock, 5.30, to run a backup manually on their computer, that sounds like a terrible control. That sounds like I'm putting the whole data in the hands of all of my staff and trusting them to do that every time. <laughs> You're absolutely right, Ashley. When I worked in practice, I was the worst at filling out a timesheet. I used to do it at the end of each week and to be honest I never remembered what I had done all week. So this one definitely definitely is another urgent one isn't it? Because the main the two main problems with this system is that everybody has the same password massive red flag and that everybody is manually backing up at the end of each day. Again massive red flag. Those two urgent points correct those and therefore they are the most important. Number one um, and number four there, I still like that, I still think we should do that, but I think number two and number five are the most important and most urgent there. <laughs> Claire, yeah, I can absolutely imagine that happening. <laughs> okay, Last little bit then, guys. Last little bit. Now here, what we need to remember is what we mean by general controls and application controls. So first off, let's think. My general controls are over the whole system. They are on the overall system. If it relates to, or you think it relates to a specific piece of software, Excel, an accounts piece of software, rather than the whole computer system, then it is an application control. So an application control then runs on a specific application within the system. So a specific piece of software, for example. General controls on the overall system, for example, backing up the system, the automatic backup for all computers run each evening. That's on the overall system, right? If you think, oh, that's just going to be on one part of something that I click on when I go in my computer, for example, my account software, Zero, QuickBooks, Sage, whatever you use, that's going to be an application control. So, now, what we need to do is, uh, it says, would the following computer controls be classed as general or application? So, it says, first off, software rejects any journals that do not balance. Well, I'm not just posting journals on an Excel spreadsheet or on a Word document, am I? That is relating to my accounts software. A very common control that lots of accounts software has built into it that it will not let you post a debit and credit that does not agree. So that is absolutely an application control because it relates to a specific piece of software, in this case, the account software. Second one, data is rejected if it falls outside a reasonable range. Application or general, or you can give me an A or a G there if you would rather. What we go in there? Yes, absolutely, guys. Well done. Application, you know, it doesn't say what specific piece of software that I'm talking about. But I would imagine, again, it is the account software. So if I put in an invoice, uh, my invoices are usually £10. And then all of a sudden, I put in an invoice for a million pounds. The system says, whoa, hold on a minute. Are you sure you meant to put that? Now, it might not be the account system, it might be something else, but it's not the overall system, is it? It is on a specific piece of software. But then finally, a disaster recovery plan has been written and tested. General or application there? Perfect. Well done, guys. Absolutely. That one is going to be general, a disaster recovery plan for the whole system. Perfect. That's my example of a general control there. So general, overall system, application specific.